most of us live our lives believing that life and death decisions are rare. And that's, of course, a very comforting gut feeling to have. But I want to argue that when we have a closer look, we discover that they're actually everywhere and can't be avoided. Suppose you're traveling on vacation in a faraway country, a poor country, say, but you have this nice cottage up the hill with a nice view over the coast and sea. But suddenly, a terrible typhoon hits and causes widespread devastation. People are starving. People lack access to clean water, lack access to medicine, and children are dying. This is actually a psychological thought experiment, a study that Harvard psychologist uh, Joshua Green is currently conducting, and he asked a group of people, so suppose you were in that situation, and suppose there was fortunately already a relief effort on the ground, and the main problem was that they needed additional supplies because they were scarce. Suppose also you had your credit card, you were there on vacation, and you could just basically help. Green then asked a group of people, do you think you have an obligation to help in this case? So let's try and see whether we can replicate that study here. How many of you believe they'd have an obligation to help in that case? Please raise your hand. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks. In Green's study, 68% of people responded that they did have an obligation to help in that case. Green then asked a separate group of people um, a similar, though slightly different question and confronted them with a slightly different scenario. And the scenario was this. Suppose not you, but a friend of yours was vacationing in this faraway country, but otherwise the catastrophic situation would be the exact same. Now, you're receiving pictures and videos from your friend, so everything your friend sees, you can see, and everything your friend hears, you can hear. And again, the easiest, the most cost-effective way, cost way to help is to just donate money. And now the psychologist comes again and ask, asks, do you have an obligation to help in that case? How many of you here believe they do have an obligation to help here as well? Please raise your hands. Okay, that's interesting too. Of course, you guys here had an unfair advantage over the people in the study because you were able to evaluate the situations jointly, which they were not. In any case, results were pretty similar. Um, the rate of acceptance of the statement that there was an obligation to help was only at 34% here. So only half as many people accepted an obligation to help in that case. But what are we to make of this shift? Is that justified, and if so, how? Or is that a completely irrational decisional pattern? In order to answer this question, we first got to get clear about what a decision actually is. A decision is always a choice between options. So if we are to analyze what's going on here, the next question we have to ask is, what's, what were the options in these cases? And if we were to justify our choice between the options in the first scenario, where we're at the site of the disaster, we'd probably analyze our choice situation roughly as follows. We have a first option that looks roughly like this. We could keep $5,000, say that's the amount of money we could donate, and let several children die. That's option one, pa a package, as it were. Options always come in packages, different things involved there, but we've got to take it the whole package or not. And option two would be to donate $5,000 and to save several children. So that's option two. We can also think about these options as worlds or future world courses that we, can change, uh, that we can choose between. So we could either go for a future world one where I have $5,000 more but several children die. Or I could go for a future world two where I have $5,000 less but several children stay alive. Now, of course, we'd go for option two here probably because not doing so, that is going for option one, would be tantamount to saying that $5,000 spent on myself and on luxury goods that I don't really need are worth more and are more important than the lives of several children that we could save. And that's a pretty implausible ethical judgment to make and probably not in line with most people's values, with what people find is of significance 
um, in their life and for the world overall. But now let's analyze uh, the decisional situation too, the second scenario. How would you, when you think about it, analyze the options here? Aren't they the same, basically? I mean, again, we'd have option one. We could keep the money and accept that several children would die that we could have saved. Or we could donate the money and save the children. In terms of what's at stake, the options seem to be exactly the same. So if you think about it this way, what could possibly justify making a difference between these two scenarios? It seems that if we are really of the opinion that the lives of several children are worth more, are more important than a few additional luxury, luxury goods to ourselves for $5,000, then I think we should be consistent and the only rational choice would be to donate the money in both cases. Now, an objection might go as follows. One might say, well, you know, decisionally, what I'm really about is just my own well-being. You know, when I'm at the site of a disaster, disaster strikes, I get to experience a very uncomfortable feeling that I want to get rid of. And that's the actual reason why I'm then helping and donating. You know, I'd feel awful if I didn't do that. But is that a convincing reply? I mean, if I were to ask you at the site of the disaster, why are you helping? Why are you donating? Would you say, oh, you know, actually, I'm not at all about helping these people. I'm about helping myself, about getting rid of this uncomfortable feeling. Is that a plausible thing to say? I think most people would believe, no, they are really about helping these other people. And they think that their lives combined are worth more than a few additional uh, luxury goods uh, for myself that I could buy for $5,000. Also, if the real reason why we help is in order to get rid of an uncomfortable feeling that we might be experiencing and that we might not be experiencing when sitting at home on the couch and just viewing the ca catastrophe from the distance through our smartphone, if we really want to get rid of, uh, of the feeling, then we could also run the following thought experiment. So if I was there at the site of the disaster as well and offered you, for instance, to take a, an advanced um, medical pill, say, that immediately removed uh, your feeling uncomfortable, then if your actual decisional goal is to remove that feeling, you'd have to accept that pill and say, OK, now I'm, I'm, I'm good. I don't have to help these people because my decisional goal has been achieved. But that seems to be very implausible. So if we really wanna, would help people for their own sake when at the site of the disaster, the reason we would give would probably be, as I said, that their lives are worth more to us than 5,000 additional dollars and some goods to ourselves. But in that case, as I said, we should be consistent and um, view the decisional situations as the same. A further important concept when we're analyzing our decisions is the concept of opportunity costs, which stands for the value of the options foregone. So if I spend $5,000 on stuff that I, don't, that I don't really need, there's a cost, an opportunity cost to that, namely the options foregone, which would be saving children. So the opportunity cost of spending $5,000 in another way are children suffering and dying. Now this slide is going to explain the totally unexpected life and death significance of an everyday bottle of water. But before I come to that, let me address um, a further objection that one might have. One might say, isn't your talk supposed to be about our daily life and death uh, decisions? But now we've talked about disaster situations, and disasters are rare. They don't strike every day. So one might admit that whenever disaster strikes, whether we're at the site of the disaster or at home, we are unavoidably making life and death decisions. But these situations are rare. Or are they? When I started thinking more deeply about these issues, I realized that I'm actually constantly on vacation, on vacation in this country, this country called planet Earth. And wow, the disaster just doesn't stop. We all know that about 20,000 children are dying each and every day from easily preventable causes mainly related to starvation. More than one billion people lack access to stable food and clean water. So that's a permanent catastrophe that's still going on every single day. And it inevitably confronts me with life and death situations, whether I like it or not, and whether I'm emotionally aware. So recently, coming to the bottle of water, I was challenged by a very smart student, remarking that, well, did you just spend $3 on this bottle of water? What was the opportunity cost of that? Couldn't you have gotten the same thing, basically, for free from the tap? 
yeah, I could indeed. And so we analyzed the opportunity costs of this decision of mine. I spent $3 on a bottle of water. What could I have done instead? If we look at what the best scientific charity evaluators around have to say on this question, so these are organizations such as Give Well, for instance, that evaluate charities and interventions, medical interventions in the developing world, for instance, according to their cost effectiveness. And they are able to scientifically show, for instance, that there are ways of curing a single child of horrible disease for a year for just 50 cents. For instance, deworming interventions, deworming a child, freeing it from horrible parasitic worms, that only costs about 50 cents per child per year. So with $3, I could save about six children, probably, from horrible diseases. That's the opportunity cost. And against this background, some decision analysts have come up with uh, the concept of a deworming currency. And this deworming currency tries to make our choices, our decisional situations, more explicit and more transparent, and I'd say more, more honest, by calculating or stating the opportunity cost immediately, the price that we indirectly pay when we spend money on stuff that we don't really need. So suppose we buy an expensive TV set, maybe that would cost about 2,000 undewarmed children. One might object that this sort of economic decision analysis is totally inappropriate when it comes to ethics. But why? I mean, there's nothing specifically economic about taking opportunity costs into account. Quite the contrary, I'd say. Taking opportunity costs into account simply acknowledges the fact that whenever we make a decision, go for one option, there will be other options that we could have gone for but did not. And those might be very ethically important too. So I think taking opportunity costs into account makes our decisions more transparent, more explicit, and thus more honest. And I'd say that's especially important when the topic is ethics, for if I'm fooling myself with regard to my decisional situation when the topic is ethics, then the, conse the consequences will inevitably be that someone somewhere will suffer and die. And I think, to some extent at least, we're probably fooling ourselves here, which might explain this irrational decisional shift. We are probably fooling ourselves, ourselves with regard to um, the life and death decisional situation that we are actually in. More and more people have come to think of our daily life and death decisions in these terms, drawing on le recent literature in ethics, psychology and decision science. And many have decided to become what one might call professional donors. They've decided to, to donate more than 50% of what they earn to the most cost-effective charities they can find. Now, 50%, that might sound like an awful lot, but actually it isn't when you think about it. If you earn an average salary in Switzerland and donate 50%, you're still very comfortably off, and you are still, it doesn't change your status as being a member of the group, of the richest group of people that ever walked the earth. And there's also psychological research that suggests that altruistic spending tends to make um, ourselves happier as well. So that's uh, the growing community of professional donors and there are also several organizations that are supporting this uh, approach, approach of uh, cost-effective high-impact ethics, for instance, the Giordano Bruno Foundation in Switzerland. Speaking of community, I'd like to ask that question in conclusion. What's the community that ultimately counts? I think it's got to be everyone for someone, somewhere, will inevitably be affected by our daily life and death decisions. Or that's how I put it if I wanted to moralize, which I don't because I'm awfully terrible at moralizing. So let me put it as follows. All this fancy ethics and decision science stuff is actually about the unexpected possibility of all of us to, well, become superheroes, one might say. For think about it, who'd have thought that we all have the possibility and that it's within the power of all of us to actually save hundreds or even thousands of lives just by making better, more rational, everyday decisions, especially when it comes to our monthly budgets. Thank you.